It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our seminar speaker for today. Um, uh, Tiago Rito uh, comes to us from uh, Dartmouth College, where approximately two weeks ago he successfully defended his PhD thesis. So, major congrats to Tiago for that. Um, uh, well, so so you, well, no, we can applaud now, but he doesn't have the piece of paper yet because he has certain you know typos and other type things that have to be addressed. But but. Uh, uh, Typos, yeah, because there couldn't have been anything else wrong with his thesis at that at this point in time. Uh, uh, Tiago, for those of you that are in HAO, Tiago was here this summer. Um, uh, he has been working pretty closely with uh, Mary Hudson, who is his PhD thesis advisor, and, and some other folks at Dartmouth, including Brian Cress. And we have the distinct pleasure that he has received a Jack Eddy uh, fellowship and will be coming out, or actually I guess he's now out uh, here in Boulder working uh, uh, under the tutelage of uh, Scott Elkington over at LASP and working collaboratively with me on some things as well. So uh, with that introduction, I'll let Tiago actually tell you a bit about the science of electron radiation belt studies and the work that he's been doing. So without further ado. Okay, thank you, Mike, and uh, it's good to be back here at HAO, see some uh, familiar faces from the summer. Uh, and uh, okay, so this is the topic of my PhD thesis, and uh, I'll be talking to you with which... Uh, deals with uh, the radiation belt population uh, and uh, I uh, look, looked at precipitation, the influence of ULF oscillations in the precipitation using uh, simulations. So, okay, let's move on. Uh, I think, uh, can everyone hear me, hear me fine? Okay. Okay, uh, so a brief outline. I will uh, introduce the uh, radiation belts just talk about the uh, basic characteristics of the, this population, some observation and theory, uh, types of loss, which is what, what I'm going to focus on, uh, talk about the ULF waves a little bit, and then introduce our numerical uh, modeling, and then present the actual uh, results, uh, mainly focused on, on the first uh, storm there, the January 21st, 2005 CME storm. Okay, so why study the radiation belts? Uh, I just think it's a, uh, it's a cool topic because it's a natural particle acceleration and it's a you know, relativistic chaotic di dynamic system. Uh, but it also we have to think about the space weather side of it, which uh, can be, you know, th this population has a major impact in satellites, and so there's a lot of research done to understand uh, and try to model and predict uh, their behavior. Uh, you know, it affects GPS and uh, occasionally uh, electrical power, or, uh, well, that's more a geomagnetic storm, but not radiation belt specifically. Uh, and then, you know, it's potentially deadly to astronauts and et cetera. So, uh, what is, so how, how does the, this population look like when you look at the magnetosphere? It's, uh, they, it's focused around uh, the inner belt here and in, in outer belt with a so-called slot region in the middle. Uh, and, you know, it has this uh, shape, donut shape, because it follows the magnetic field lines, obviously. And this is a, a snapshot of a typical flux profile, uh, which is dependent on the, on the call latitude. But here, because this comes from a polar satellite observation, uh, they just uh, you know, didn't uh, include the call latitude variation. But just this uh, dependence on the radial distance here, that usually there's a peak around uh, L equals four, which is uh, distance at the equator uh, f at four RE, and then it drops off at uh, a higher Ls. But uh, let's see if this works here. Okay, a little movie showing the temporal variation. There's even some music here. Uh, so this is a kind of a movie put, you get, put together by NASA for the Van Allen probes and it shows how uh, typically that's the moon here 
going by, and it shows it like the temporal variation of of the fluxes in in, in the radiation belts during a few days. Uh, the date here is not is not correct, but there was a geomagnetic storm, and you can see that sometimes you know they they expand and sometimes they contract a lot, and the fluxes vary. So I just think it's a interesting little movie to show the temporal variation here. Okay, so uh, a few basics about this uh, population. It's mostly electrons with the uh, protons restricted to the inner zone. For, for this work, I will focus mostly on the electrons. And they're, you know, the energetic part of the, of the plasma population in the magnetosphere. So they range between 100 kV to tens of MeV for the, for the protons. They are extremely low density, so much less than one uh, cent centimeter cubed, particle per centimeter cubed. Uh, typically, there are two sources for, the, for this population. One is the plasma sheet, the tail uh, low energy population that sometimes can uh, be uh, uh, pushed from the tail into the, in, into the uh, inner magnetosphere and get energized. And the ring current also, they can, uh, particles here can get uh, energized and then become more energetic and part of the radiation belt population. Uh, so losses, uh, there are two main types of losses, which one is to the atmosphere, which uh, I'm going to focus on on this talk. Uh, but uh, there's also a very typical type of loss, which is to the magnetopause. If the magnetopause is compressed, then uh, 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 you know, it moves it moves inward, and so the particles that were at that particular L shell encounter the magnetopause and and get lost to the uh, to the uh, outer space. And so lifetimes are typical. You know, they, they can range a lot from one day or a hundred days for the inner zone. So this is another example uh, or another plot that shows the time, the long-term variability of the radiation belts. This is from the Simpex uh, satellite, which is a polar orbit satellite. And uh, from, this is only electrons from two to six MeV. And so the top panel here shows the kind of the, sun, the sunspot uh, variation over uh, one and a half solar cycles per, or, yeah, about, uh, uh, like 17 years or so, and and so here this uh, this is the L value, which is the uh, distance from uh, from the Earth uh, at the at the equatorial plane that you can map to the footprint to the foot points in the in the uh, close to Earth. And so, you know, you can see that there's a general peak of fluxes. The, the color scale is flux, and this is ears. Uh, there's a general peak at around 4, L equals 4, with uh, these uh, storms, you know, playing an important role here in the, in the flux variation, the long-term variation. Uh, the CIR storms are, uh, they're longer duration, so they, uh, uh, they cause this kind of long, long-term uh, enhancement in fluxes. The CME storms uh, are they are more uh, prompt, and so they uh, they cause uh, uh, effects that are not really seen on the on these plots here because this is too long-term, and so the, the, they can uh, affect the radiation belts in a matter of uh, minutes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's. And also, so also notice the uh, outer belt and the inner, uh, the I mean the outer boundary and the inner boundary variation here, uh, long term. So it's a very highly di uh, highly dynamic population, which uh, it's very hard to predict actually. So this is a uh, the same time type of plot, only showing a, a, a shorter period of about uh, two years. And this is a, a big, big storm that happened in, during Halloween 2003 that uh, injected, you know, the, the electron population here in the inner belt and persisted for, uh, you know, a couple of years, uh, which is, you know, the, 
it's an example of a, a kind of extreme, extreme event that uh, happens uh, sometimes. And uh, I'm uh, the the storm that I'm uh, going to focus on happened here, which doesn't look uh, you know doesn't look uh, very impressive, but it was uh, very uh, strong. Although it was a very uh, sudden and short storm, it was very intense. So it produced some uh, interesting observations that I'm going to show later. And this is a more recent uh, example of the kind of plot that I've shown from uh, Den Baker's science paper uh, this year. And uh, so this is data now from the Van Allen probes, which was launched next, uh, last year. And again, we, we see uh, you know, a, f a flux peak at, at around four, and you know, the inner belt here you can see, and uh, this is a solar wind parameter, so you can see that you know, uh, things happen when the, due to uh, events at the sun. You know, there's, there's disruption in BZ, for instance, that caused an energization. Uh, but the type of event that I'm going to uh, focus on today is uh, the, a loss type of event. So, uh, like, f not this one in particular, but, you know, it's, uh, this is an example of uh, one that, you know, there was a strong CME storm here, as you can see by uh, DST, and then very suddenly there was a very fast loss of the radiation belt. So. Uh, we want to understand what's happening here. What, why is it uh, being lost? And what, how it's being lost, and so on. These are the questions we have in mind. So let me briefly uh, just introduce some some theory and nomenclature here. Uh, when we talk about the radiation belt motion, we talk about we, it's important to talk about the three invariants of motion. Uh, the gyro motion, which is related to the motion of the of the electron or the particle around its uh, magnetic field line, and typically for the electrons, the gyro frequency is in the kilohertz uh, range. The bounce motion, uh, it's, which is related to the second invariant here, is related to the uh, to the motion between the hemispheres that the particle uh, makes. Uh, and so the typical frequency is in the hertz uh, range for the electrons. And uh, the third invariant is related to the drift motion around the Earth of the particle. And its uh, frequency is in the millihertz range. And, you know, this, this uh, invariant is uh, very easily broken during a storm, as the ones we're going to see. But these two are uh, usually conserved. And uh, okay, so let's just introduce some uh, more nomenclature here. I don't know if uh, people are familiar with the South Atlantic anomaly or in the in the loss cone, but you know the idea is that uh, a particle is mirroring here between hemispheres, and and the angle between the momentum and the field line is the pitch angle, and if the pitch angle is small enough. Like here, the particle is said to be inside of the loss cone because it's, it gets uh, closer to the atmosphere and then collides with uh, the neutral particles here and it get, gets lost. And so uh, the loss cone threshold is typically around 5 degrees. So uh, if a particle has smaller, a pitch angle smaller than 5, it's usually lost and then if, it, if it's uh, trapped, then it's, it's outside of the loss cone. And I'm going to be talking also about the drift loss cone, which has to do with the uh, South Atl Atlantic Anomaly, which is a you know, region uh, around south of here, this region that, where the magnetic fields are weaker. And so as the particle is drifting uh, around the Earth, it is more likely to get lost uh, here at these longitudes than out here. And so if, if the particle, uh, you know, if it's maybe mirroring here, maybe outside of the uh, loss cone here, but if it doesn't make it around, then it's said to be inside of the drift loss cone because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't uh, complete one full drift around the Earth. 
Okay, so uh, about losses, there are two big questions that uh, we usually try to address uh, when talking about uh, radiation belts. One is, which one is more uh, relevant? Is it uh, the atmospheric loss, this one that, you know, it, while it's bouncing, it, uh, it gets too close to the atmosphere and gets lost, or the magnetopause loss that uh, happens when the uh, magnetosphere is compressed due to a, a shock. Uh, so this question is still uh, open, and, and it, it probably depends on the storm. And I just did a simulation here to compare with my uh, uh, population here, which is not, uh, 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 it doesn't represent a, a, a real population, but you know, but I can compare, you know, the magnetopause loss to the precipitation loss uh, with uh, with this uh, code that we use that I'm going to talk about more. What energies are these? These here. No. Uh, these are between the, for this simulation I use between half and six MeV, so uh, on the on the higher energy side of of things. Uh, but this is usually energy independent, this uh, process here, but I'll, I'll talk more about it. And so the other big question is, uh, as was uh, pointed out by uh, Reeves et al. 2003, uh, how can we predict what happens after a, a storm? So he uh, did a statistical study putting uh, several moderate storms together and measuring the flux that goes before and after the storm. And so you can see that, you know, sometimes you have uh, an increase in the flux after the storm, sometimes it decreases. And sometimes uh, you have little variation. So uh, it's kind of a outstanding question how to predict this. Uh, Uh, okay, so just a little introduction on ULF waves. Uh, ULF waves is uh, ultra low frequency waves that uh, occur frequently in the magnetosphere, and they uh, are they inter interact with the uh, electrons because they their frequency is typically on the on the range of the uh, gyro of the drift motion of the electron. So. Uh, they can interact, you know, there's a, there's a energization, uh, you can get energization if you have the electric field of the wave uh, in the same direction of the drift velocity, you know, over a drift period, so you can get the, uh, the particle energized. And if the frequencies are different, then, you know, there's no net gain of energy. And so uh, there's this classic study from Rose Stocker Earl, that shows uh, this, so the blue line is uh, ULF power measured uh, at the ground, and the green is electron flux measured that goes. And so he saw you know, a, a correlation between these two things. You know, usually you get uh, ULF power, and then a few uh, day or so later, you get an increase in, in the fluxes of goes. You know, and this is over several days, uh, and so you know the the conclusion is there's a there's a clear correlation between uh, the flux and ULF power. But what I'm going to talk about here is the the correlation between ULF and, and precipitation, which is less uh, uh, it's less known or less talked about. So the simulations that we are doing, uh, you know, the radiation belts is a it's a it's a ideal population for the test particle approach which uh, we use. Uh, so we, we we don't need to worry about self consistency because you know the the particles are so low density that that they don't uh, they don't contribute to the to the fields, and so we use. Uh, uh, well, it's it, you know it's also good to look at the global picture as opposed to satellite measurements. 
Uh, we can simulate ideal conditions as well as uh, real storms. And uh, uh, so we, it's also important to compare with observations to see if our uh, simulation is uh, working. So we use LFM as um, I know a lot of you are familiar with LFM. And this is LFM in one slide. Uh, it uses solar wind parameters as uh, the initial conditions, or I mean the boundary conditions. Uh, so we we can simulate real storms from if we take uh, data from a satellite or some other uh, Omni or something, and then uh, we use this uh, boundary condition, this uh, temporal boundary condition, to drive the magnetosphere. Uh, and so LFM uses uh, ideal MHD equations on a 3D grid to, to uh, follow the plasma com conditions in the magnetosphere, the electric field, magnetic field, and velocity, and so on. And this is a, one of the nice features of the code is that it has a, a grid adapted to the magnetosphere. So we, use, we run simulations for a, a, a few storms, and then we use these fields as input to our uh, test particle code to drive the our electrons and, and then you know see our results from there and this is the uh, equations that our test particle code uses it can use it can follow the uh, relativistic Lorentz equation when necessary but typically it uses a guiding center equation uh, derived from uh, Carey and Brizard uh, this is uh, derived from uh, Hamiltonian, uh, so it's a, it's a long paper, but the, these equations is, are the ones that we use, and they, uh, they update uh, the position, and because you're using just a guiding center, you only need to worry about the parallel momentum of uh, the particles. And the co so the code tests if uh, the, the gradients are big enough that, uh, uh, you know, then that the first invariant might be broken, so it switches to Lorentz, uh, and so you can you are able to track the full gyro motion of the particle. But usually, these uh, equations here are sufficient to follow the particle. And so, so this is a typical plot of uh, an example of a particle how it moves in in the in this uh, grid. Though this is a, an, an example from Brian Kress, he was uh, looking at solar energetic electrons, and this particular particle, you know, is, as you can see here, I think you can see here the 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 code follows the gyro motion of the particle here, you know, as it's bouncing, and then uh, as it is it as it's uh, getting trapped in the magnetosphere, it switches to guiding center. So right here. The, the code stops uh, uh, stops the Lorentz equation and starts on the guiding center equations and uh, it's just following the, the bounce motion and the drift motion of the particles. Can I ask a question about Yeah. I think that this, this simulation, in my mind, answers the question, how do the radiation develops? First of all, is that, is that right? I mean, you, you start with a solar wind particle or any other particle. It, it has significant energy, but it's not nearly as energetic as the radiation. Right, right, right. So somehow in this process, it gets energized. Right. So where does that energy come from? So, so this is uh, this is all happening during uh, the f as the fields are are changing. So this is time evolving fields, and so. Uh, I am not entirely familiar with this paper, but if if uh, I remember discussions that we had, this happens during strong uh, CME storms, and then you have uh, electric fields inside the magnetosphere, and you have uh, uh, just the compression and. Uh, so th this process is not going on continuously. This is a storm. Right? Right, right. This this particular plot is from a storm, so it, it's not in the times. You know, the fields are evolving, so so you have the electric fields there, 
that are uh, driving the particles inward. And so as they're conserving their first invariant, they get energized as they move inward. And is this just a selected particle that happens to move yeah, inward? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So this, this is one that happened to make it in. Exactly, exactly. So he, the way he did it was he, you know, he launched uh, millions of particles into during this storm, and then one of them, this one, happened to be trapped, and so he he plotted this one. But of course, there's a, I think m more don't get trapped, much more don't get trapped. Than, uh, that particle, there start inside the magnetosphere. No, it starts uh, outside. outside so, 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 magnetosphere somewhere between four, four, yeah. four and six. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, now let's let's move to uh, the actual results. Uh, so the motivation for for doing this study is to uh, understand the uh, modulation of precipitation observed by uh, balloon measurements frequently, and so as as an example, this is a, a, a mish, uh, campaign balloon campaign called Barrel that was launched uh, earlier this year, and uh, it, it it has uh, X-ray detectors on balloons to detect uh, the brimstone radiation from the precipitating electrons. So it's able to uh, detect precipitation on a, not directly, but indirectly through the, through the uh, x-ray, Bremsstrahl and x-rays. So, and then, you know, it, this, this particular day uh, provided a good uh, example of, of these uh, of the oscillations that are observed in the, you, you know, usually, yeah, one or two minutes in the uh, ULF frequency range, which is, uh, you know, around uh, 10 millihertz or on that on that uh, range. Uh, and I have more uh, of these type of figures, so let's just uh, move on here. Oh, this is another example, also in January of this year now showing uh, this is three different balloons that were up at the same time and because they had a different L positions and azimuthal positions you know this one didn't see anything but these two balloons saw uh, you know events uh, these oscillations in the in the precipitation and this this is uh, counts x-ray counts and this is a uh, solar wind parameters this is a dynamic pressure so there was a, a storm going on at this time and then and also later here. And at the same time, the balloon observed you know, peaks in, in precipitation and so on with uh, these, uh, these oscillations here. So the question is, what, what's causing this, uh, this uh, oscillations? So, uh, Okay, so this is the storm that we are going to be talking about for the next few slides. It was a CME storm that happened in uh, 2005. And uh, yeah, we, we use ACE data to simulate this event with LFM and then compare the, the precipitation results with uh, this time the Minas campaign, which was a similar campaign to Barrel that uh, uh, was uh, run in 2005, and these campaigns are from uh, Robin Millen at Dartmouth and, and others. Uh, okay, so this is the results of, uh, it's funny, my plot looks better than here, but uh, I can describe the axis here. Uh, okay, so this is uh, uh, ACE data capturing solar wind uh, parameters this is dynamic pressure, and I'm going to focus on this storm that happened here where uh, dynamic pressure jumped from 0 to 20 nanotesla uh, in a matter of uh, a minute or two. And this is how BZ behaved. And this is the result of the 
LFM simulation. This shows a uh, electric field in the phi direction at uh, three different locations, but most importantly uh, at noon, right at the, on the day side, at L equals 6.6. .6. And so notice that these, this storm here uh, produced these waves observed uh, throughout the magnetosphere with, with uh, a frequency of, there's a peak here at around eight millihertz. And uh, uh, the amplitude reached uh, close to 60 millivolts per meter. So we're gonna talk about this number later, but uh, the main point here is that uh, the LFM you know, captures these ULF oscillations quite well. And, okay, and this is from the same storm. This is the precipitation observations from the, from the Minus uh, balloon, one of, one of them. And this is integrated all over uh, all energy channels. And you know, you can see that there's a, there's a oscillation here with kind of in the millihertz frequency range, which is, this is just a blow up of this part here. So Minus also observed uh, precipitation later, uh, a few hours later and so on, but I'm gonna focus on this first uh, part here. This is, uh, this is a, this should be on the previous slide, which, which is another example of oscillations that Merrill, this was a Barrel test flight in 2009, it saw also these oscillations, which the point is that they're very frequently observed. Okay, and so this is, so uh, let me describe briefly my simulation. Uh, I launched a million particles in, the, in these fields during this storm with, uh, with a flat distribution in energy, L, and pitch angle between uh, four and eight degrees. So uh, I wanna focus on the region around the LOSCOM that I talked about, so there's, there's no point in in for me to simulate uh, an, an electron mirroring at the equatorial plane because that's not gonna precipitate, uh, no way. So uh, I had to, due to computer uh, limitations, I had to focus on my pitch angle population between four and eight. Uh, and so this, you know, it's a caveat because it's not a realistic population, but we can surely drive some conclusions from it. And so this is uh, precipitation counts uh, simulated. This is now uh, the simulation results. Precipitation counts and time. Uh, this whole time is around uh, 20 minutes. And you know, initially, as soon as I launch the particles, there's a, a lot of them that get Im immediately lost because they are already in the loss cone. And so as, the, as they are drifting around the Earth, the particles are f uh, filling the drift loss cone and until you know all of them drift at least once around the earth and then uh, and then they, they reach a steady state here and this is the time that the shock arrives and so we see this uh, this pattern of oscillation in the, in the precipitation simulated precipitation so th and this is a blow up of this part here so you know it, you can see that it, it you know, we, we captured this kind of uh, oscillation that uh, the Minus balloon also captured. And uh, this is, uh, well, I don't know why the uh, pictures look so fuzzy. It looks better on my computer, but uh, this is just a, a, a world map and it shows the precipitation flux before and after the storm or during the storm. And uh, the, I just wanted to show that the flux is all concentrated in the uh, South Atlantic anomaly as we uh, saw uh, earlier. And so this is a, a frequency comparison of the simulated precipitation, which shows a peak at around uh, eight millihertz. And uh, this is the simulated E phi a geosynchronous from LFM, which also shows a peak at around you know, the same frequency. And this is the min minus data. 
So it was really nice to see that uh, at least uh, the peak frequency was captured by the by the simulation. And uh, so and, and now the question is what why is this happening? Why is the precipitation uh, flux at the at at the atmosphere similar to the ULF oscillations in the magnetosphere? And uh, this is a this is a, a picture of a plot of the trapped population showing that they get also energized by the by the uh, ULF oscillations and the uh, pitch angle distribution showing uh, just the time evolution several different times showing that the uh, lower pitch angle population is depleted here. Uh, this is on a, a kind of a side note. I tried to compare precipitation loss with uh, magnetopause loss for this same storm. Uh, and, and so this is now in a log plot and uh, this is the precipitation and this is the magnetopause loss. But again, uh, I have to wait these, this population to be able to actually compare and, and make some kind of prediction uh, as to why, which one is more relevant during this particular storm. But we can see, you know, from the, uh, this is the magnetopause location now. It starts at around uh, 8 and then very quickly it uh, gets down to uh, 6 or so during the storm. This is also uh, simulated by LFM, so it's not a observation, but uh, it, it uh, shows how much the magnetosphere is compressed during this storm, which you know it's uh, understandable why we have so much uh, so much loss to the magnetopause here. But back to the precipitation. So now the question is how uh, what's causing this precipitation? How to understand? what's driving these electrons. So right here I show, uh, I picked also one particular particle that uh, was non-precipitating and one that uh, did precipitate during the storm to see, uh, and I plotted you know, their parallel momentum, perpendicular momentum, pitch angle and L dependence uh, on the equatorial plane and try to see what's the uh, difference. So these two had uh, the same pitch angle, same initial L, similar energy, but they had a different drift, <coughs> drift phase with respect to the waves. And so the main thing that we see between these two here is that the, the particle that precipitated, it was uh, driven inward constantly uh, because it, it, was, it had a different uh, drift phase. and so it interacted with the ULF waves differently. So this one continuously came inward starting at 5.5 until almost 4.5. And this one kind of went winward initially but then came back out and kind of stayed there. And so this one, this is the kind of the SAA effect where this is the mirror point and so it gets every drift orbit, it gets closer to the uh, to the boundary, which is 1RE, the precipitation boundary, but then it never uh, makes it to 1RE. And this one, kind of uh, right here, it, it made uh, reach 1RE, and so it, it was lost to the atmosphere. And so we learned that the, uh, the L, uh, the, the inward motion during the storm, and this is very uh, fast, so this is not a or, uh, kind of a diffusive effect where, which happens during the course of a day or, so, or more. This, this all happens during uh, like 10 minutes, you know, a, few, a, few, a couple of drift orbits. And so in the, the L depend, the, uh, this inward motion here is correlated with the uh, parallel momentum of the particle. And this has to do with the drift, uh, with, the Fermi, with the Fermi acceleration. If the, if the particle is, bound, is uh, bouncing here, and then if it, if it moves inward, it sees a, a shorter fi uh, field line length. And it's as if the mirror points of the particle are coming closer together. And so, and this is, the, this is essentially the Fermi acceleration. If you have the mirror points of a bouncy particle, 
coming in together, they accelerate in the parallel uh, direction. And, uh, and so this is the kind of the last slide explaining this mechanism. Uh, there, there's an L dependence on the loss con angle as well. And so this is another way of understanding the same thing. When you have a, a particle moving inward, so this is L shell and this is pitch angle or yeah, angle. And so the blue line here shows the loss con angle, which is, uh, there's an L dependence here. But as a particle, if a particle is out here and it moves inward, uh, conserving the first and second adiabatic invariance, it doesn't, uh, their L dependence is not as steep as the loss cone dependence. And so if it moves uh, inward enough, it uh, eventually reaches the loss cone and gets lost. Uh, this is the main, this is the main idea that uh, I wanted to show here. And so uh, just to finish, uh, well, this is this is this is it for this storm. And now uh, I try to analyze this storm also, which I showed previously. You know, it showed kind of the same signature, this increase in dynamic pressure in the solar wind, uh, and it showed you know precipitation observed by the balloons. And so I simulated uh, with LFM, and LFM showed uh, ULF. Uh, you know, act, uh, yeah, LFM power throughout the, the time. But the problem is that this uh, increase here wasn't strong enough to generate uh, the amplitude that the other storm generated. So this is, you know, this increase was, was from zero to five and uh, the other storm uh, reached 20 nanopascal in a, in a, in a very, uh, very fast, and so when I simulated with LFM, the the ULF waves weren't uh, as uh, big. Their amplitude was much smaller. The other reached a peak of 60 millivolts per meter, and during this storm, it was uh, around four millivolts per meter. So this essentially, I get uh, I see no precipitation when I simulate this storm. And, uh, you know, even though it was uh, frustrating, but it tells us that maybe this mechanism needs a, a strong ULF or a huge impact, a huge CME from the sun to, to take effect. And, and another explanation is, of course, uh, EMIC waves or other high frequency waves that can uh, uh, scatter the particle in pitch angle and drive them immediately in, into the loss cone, which LFM does not, uh, does not have, does not uh, have any of these uh, high frequency modes. You know, LFM is only able to, uh, there's a, a time constraint there, and so it's not able to uh, pick up these, all these waves in the frequency, in the uh, Hertz frequency range. So, and so this is observations from, uh, Ghosts showing that during this time in, in January of this year, there was some uh, ULA, uh, EMIC activity. And so the hypothesis is that the ULF waves can be uh, modulating the EMIC waves, which can be scattering the particles into the pitch angle. But this is a, this is a, it's kind of a Robin's, uh, idea, which uh, well, I don't know much about, but anyway. So this is uh, just the uh, the way this research, uh, the future directions that I want to add is to do a better comparison between magnetopause and precipitation. Investigate uh, instead of only CMEs, investigate uh, CIR storms. And so I need to uh, uh, a weighted particle distribution to do that. And uh, I also, I ha didn't talk about this, but I used a non-evolving plasma sphere to do my simulation. And, and because they are so short, uh, a short period, it's not a big problem. But if I want to simulate CIRs, uh, I hope to be using uh, the RCM model coupled with LFM 
to uh, which uh, does a better job at at the inner region there. And also, I plan to study uh, another effect called Shabansky orbits, which is uh, has to do with a non, uh, kind of a uh, as the particles are drifting, if if the day side is very compressed, they can they can be scattered in the second invariant, and this can cause the uh, precipitation also. So the main conclusion of all this is that uh, you know a strong shot can can cause energization in the parallel and perpendicular direction, but we need a large amplitude ULF for the uh, radio transport to be strong enough to drive the particles into the loss column. So uh, this result was obtained without the higher frequency waves, which can also scatter the, the electrons. Uh, but of course, this is also another hypothesis for, for the modulation observed. And this is it. Thank you. Thank you, Tiago. Uh, there's time for some questions, if folks have some. How did I do in time? This was OK. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I should know this. Uh, does, does the LFM spontaneously generate ULF waves? Yeah. Or, or, or do you have to impose them? No. So it, it spontaneously re generates them in response to, in response to magnet uh, storm to events. shock, that's right. That's right. Yeah, in a quiescent yeah. situation, will it just? In what? If it's in a quiescent situation, will it generate ULF waves? So maybe I'm asking the wrong guy. <laughs> May I? <laughs> so it depends on the solar wind driving, but you can get ULF waves generated in, in steady um, solar wind conditions. Uh, the Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities that are occurring on the flank drive ULF waves into the, in the inner magnetosphere, so they show up for even the steady driving. But the variability in the solar wind is one of the bigger drivers of the, of the ULF intensity, and especially the shocks and whatnot that generate you know, waves that bounce around inside the system. Yeah, usually the, on the day side, it's due to the uh, compression, <coughs> to the dynamic pressure variation, and in the flanks, it's uh, usually coming out. That drives the, as observed by LFM. So it would be fair to say that this process is going on continuously and, and providing energization to the range. Right, right. That's what I was trying to get. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, as a source of energization, but I don't think the Kelvin Kevin, Kevin Helmholtz uh, instabilities have a uh, strong enough amplitude to, to, to drive precipitation. I think, I think we, need, we need a strong shock to drive the ULFs needed for this kind of precipitation. But it may be, uh, you know, maybe the other higher frequency waves can, can be uh, uh, generated by the ULF in the flanks. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll see everybody next week.